I'm sitting here today in Fall Creek Falls State Park. It's about a 26,000 acre park, and it's one of the last places that we see old growth forest here in the Southern Appalachians. This is what most people imagine the original landscape of the Eastern U.S. was like prior to European settlement. If you close your eyes, you can almost imagine massive trees growing so thick that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River without ever touching the ground. Old growth forests have captured our imagination for centuries, and there's broad agreement from the conservation community and the public that these are special places. It's no wonder that most of the natural areas and parks of the eastern U.S. are focused on protecting forests, much like this one. In the minds of most people, the forests of the east stretch westward until finally giving way to the Midwestern tallgrass prairie and eventually to the Great Plains. However, recent ecological and historical research has revealed that the eastern U.S. landscape was not covered in one vast unending forest, but in fact was a complicated and diverse mosaic of forests, woodlands, wetlands, and grasslands. But most people think about America's grasslands, they picture those found in Illinois or Kansas. And while southern grasslands may not have been as vast as their Midwestern cousins, what they lack in size is made up for by their astounding biodiversity. So we're in May Prairie, and this is one of the most special places that I can think of. This is truly a sacred gem when it comes to landmarks within the eastern United States. We're in what is basically a virgin old growth grassland. And when we think about what it means to be an old growth grassland, that's a pretty foreign concept. Most of us think about old growth forests, but never do we think about grasslands as being ancient. Well, that's exactly what this is. To most people, this ancient prairie may not look like anything special at first, but upon closer inspection, we see that it differs from the mundane fields and pastures that we pass by every day in several key ways. Unlike old fields and pastures with only a few dozen weedy or common species, natural grasslands are exceptionally biodiverse. They may be home to hundreds of native grasses, sedges, wildflowers, and shrubs, dozens of birds, and countless insects. Making up a substantial portion of the biodiversity of natural grasslands are what we call conservative species. These are found only in good to high quality natural habitats and they're not capable of thriving in degraded or unnatural sites. Their presence is often an indicator of intact habitat. One example is the May Prairie Aster. This undescribed species was discovered in 2008 and occurs here in the single 10 acre prairie remnant and nowhere else in the world. Another conservative species is the Tennessee featherbells. This is a new species to science that occurs in wet grasslands at just a handful of other similar sites near May Prairie. The grasslands of the south came in all shapes and sizes. Some were vast and similar in many aspects to the great prairies of the Midwest. They included both treeless prairies and open oak and pine savannas that collectively once covered millions of acres across the south from Virginia to Texas. The region was also home to a variety of small-scale types of grasslands, including rocky glades, high-elevation grass bulbs in the southern Blue Ridge Mountains, and many types of wet grasslands, such as open wet meadows, fens, and bogs. The Grand Prairie ecoregion once had probably about a half a million acres of treeless grassland. Today there's less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of that left, about 430 acres is all that remains of that prairie. Uh, this is one of the largest pieces, about 40 acres. This is all that's left, just a few isolated scraps. And they're surrounded for miles and miles in just a sea of agriculture. It's primarily rice, soybeans, now corn, a little bit of cotton. But that's predominantly what's replaced the prairie in this region. While we're fortunate to have even a few of these remnants left, they're just shadows of what used to be. They're nearly all small, isolated, and far apart, like islands in a sea. Most of the species dependent on these remnants can't move from one patch to another across the many miles of highly altered landscapes that separate them. And even though they're small, they're really our last hope for restoring uh, larger areas of prairie. This would be the, the seed source of uh, the restoration project that might go on to restore habitat on kind of a more meaningful scale. But even these tiny remnants are critical habitat for some plants and animals. They still contain surprises. 
A few years ago, I was walking through this prairie, stepped on a rock, and kept going. Then it hit me. There are no rocks in East Arkansas. I retraced my steps and looked down to find an ornate box turtle, a prairie-dependent species thought to have vanished from the region nearly 30 years before. You know, grasslands are on their last leg. Across the southeast, we've lost 90%. And where are grasslands that remain? Most of them are in right-of-ways. And this has been an abandoned railroad right-of-way. All the land around it was plowed for agriculture, but this one strip was left. And it actually burned periodically from broken wheels on the railroads. They used to throw sparks a lot and start fires. But it's an ancient grassland. This has been basically just like it is now for thousands and thousands of years. And it's a, the last remnant of that ancient grassland left. And just this railroad right-of-way has over 400 species uh, of plants documented from it. And a lot of them are very rare. And there's some important species here, like this butterfly milkweed. That's a host plant for the monarch butterfly and very valuable to a lot of different species of insects. This is an example of a large native grassland managed with periodic prescribed burning. Most eastern grasslands need some sort of periodic disturbance to keep woody plants from outcompeting the grasses and wildflowers. Fire is the most universal of these, but historically browsing and grazing by large herbivores like elk and bison were also important. In some circumstances, well-managed cattle grazing can be a surrogate for the historical effects of elk and bison as can cutting for hay. Many of the prairies left today got through the past 75 to 100 years as hay meadows. The hay was cut once a year, which kept the woody plants from encroaching, but left the native diversity intact. Southern grasslands continue to yield surprising discoveries. One of the most notable recent examples came in the 1990s, just outside Birmingham, Alabama, when an unexplored ecosystem of dolomite barrens known as the Ketona Glades was found along the Little Cahaba River. During a weekend canoe trip, botanists identified 10 new unnamed plant species in just a handful of rocky riverside grasslands that are found nowhere else outside an eight kilometer stretch of river. This amazing discovery, often heralded as a botanical lost world in Alabama, is now publicized on the sides of U-Haul vans. While discoveries like this are very rare in the U.S., there are still on average about five new plant species named from across the southeast each year. Why, just this month, a beautiful new orchid was described from the subtropical prairies of central Florida. And right now, botanists are aware of 99 unnamed new plant species from southern grasslands. Let's not forget about new species of animals. In 2015, 21 new species of grasshoppers were discovered in southern grasslands. And numerous undescribed species of burrow and crayfish have been found in wet grassland remnants in the region. Scientists are currently re-examining populations of mice in the grass bulbs atop Roan Mountain in the southern Appalachians. Research suggests that these grassland mice may represent an unrecognized species distinct from the mice that live in the surrounding forests. Until conclusive genetic work can be finalized, researchers have nicknamed this grassland variant the Cloudlands Deer Mouse. Glades and Barrens are ancient islands of rocky grassland in a sea of forest. They're open in part because of their thin soils with the underlying bedrock exposed or very near the surface of the ground. They may be wet during the winter and spring, but are extremely dry, probably our driest habitats during the hot part of the year. In that sense, glades are basically mini deserts with a long history going back to hotter, drier climatic periods in the past. They often support western desert species like prickly pear cactus, yucca, tarantulas, scorpions, and collared lizards. Glades are classified according to the type of bedrock they form on, and each type is unique. Many are rich in rare species, including endemics that may be found in one particular glade type and nowhere else on Earth. There's a lot of misconceptions about grasslands. Most people think that grasslands have to be open and um, nearly treeless, like the Great Plains. But this is a pretty good example of one that actually has a lot of trees. Yeah, this fire-maintained oak savanna is a grassland with trees scattered through it. it has all these sun-loving grassland plants on the ground, high biodiversity, really important habitat for many species of animals and plants, a lot of grassland birds. 
You know, we're standing in what is probably one of the rarest habitat types in Eastern North America. We have obviously old growth trees, some of which may date to in excess of 300 years in age. And it's sad to realize that there actually used to be millions and millions of acres of savanna across the Southeast. You know, but we're fortunate because these savannas may be our most restorable grassland type left. That's right. A lot of them are not necessarily gone. They're just so dense, they're unrecognizable. And we can come into a site like this, but with more trees in it, thin the trees out, reintroduce fire as an ecological process. And if the species are still present on the ground or in the seed bank, sometimes we can restore these, or in fact, they almost restore themselves. Yeah, the diversity is exceptional. Between an area of you and I, you can have as many as 40 species occupying a single square meter in some savannas of the southeast. At a larger scale, say in a, a block of land 10 meters by 10 meters, you can have as many as 90 species. These are temperate North America's richest ecosystems. And so one question would be, what has the loss of this type of grassland, these treed grasslands, what type of impact has that had on wildlife? Think about all the species of wildlife that are found in these savannas. All the bird species, insects, reptiles, amphibians, small mammals that use these systems. Right. That's probably one of the reasons why we're seeing the collapse of species like northern bobwhite. Its population is projected to cut in half in the next 12 years by 2029. And then seven to eight years after that, it's gonna decline by half again. This trip to Massard Prairie, Fort Smith, has turned out to be a visit to pay the last rites to this incredible prairie remnant, thousands of years old, about to be destroyed for another housing development. I just kind of went into instinct mode and started collecting every plant I saw just to try to document what's here before it's lost forever. Hundreds of species, a lot of them rare, tracked uh, in Arkansas, a species of concern. They'll be gone in, they say, 30 days. None of the prairie here is protected. Historically, it was one of the largest prairie uh, areas we had in the state called Massard Prairie. It's uh, famous among naturalists. It was visited by Thomas Nuttall, this English botanist, in 1819. There's some prairie in the next county over protected by the state and the Nature Conservancy, but, but this area is going to be completely lost. It's sort of a rolling upland prairie, so they've excavated it down a couple of feet. Uh, presumably are putting a road in there. It's kind of a sad trip to uh, to the prairie today to, you know, we were gonna photograph some of the rare species, but uh, looks like we will be doing that for the last time. Unfortunately, the past 200 years have not been kind to these fragile southern ecosystems. Many disappeared before they could be photographed, painted, or described by early naturalists. And the vast majority east of the Mississippi River were gone by the Civil War. Our southern grasslands have been out of sight and out of mind for so long that they've been erased from our society's collective memory. This collective amnesia has led to whole generations of conservationists in the 20th century believing in the myth of the squirrel. As decades have passed, there have been so many valiant efforts to preserve southern forests and wetlands, but little attention has been paid to our vanishing and nearly extinct southern grasslands. The loss of these fragile ecosystems is one of the greatest threats facing Eastern North American biodiversity today. The Southeastern Grasslands Initiative is a developing nonprofit organization based out of Austin P. State University's Center of Excellence for Field Biology in Clarksville, Tennessee. We will step up to lead Southeastern Grasslands conservation at this critical time when something must be done to reverse the tide of grassland biodiversity loss. SGI will serve as a clearinghouse for grassland research, consultation, and education, and will work to distribute funds to accomplish effective conservation across the southeast.